Hi, and welcome to the reproductive system lecture. So we're gonna start off first with talking about the female reproductive system. So the female reproductive system consists of ovaries, two ovaries, two oviducts, the uterus, the cervix, the vagina, and the vulva. So I've got a little uh, hand-drawn drawing here. You can refer as well to figure 4-29 on page 99 in your Elsevier textbook, and um, you'll be able to see that one as well. So uh, I'm going to use this diagram to kind of tell you the story of how, uh, how reproduction happens in the female reproductive system. Uh, so this, um, this story assumes that the uh, animal got pregnant from this, uh, from this mating. So, uh, first of all, we've got our ovary right up here, okay? And this is the other ovary, so there are two. So, females are born with all their eggs for their lifetime in an immature state in the ovaries. So, various hormonal signals uh, send signals to the ovaries to mature, uh, a certain number of eggs, so um, some some animals, it, it's really like species and even breed dependent. <clears throat> so like typically for humans, right, it's usually just one egg is released, but like in dogs uh, or cats, um, a few eggs can be released. So I've seen as many, I've seen the largest uh, litter I've seen is 14 golden retrievers and I've seen as small as just one chihuahua puppy. So um, it certainly is uh, like species and breed dependent on how many eggs are released. So when, um, when the eggs mature then and are released from the ovary, that's called ovulation. And so the little egg, here's the matured egg. Oh, it ovulates, it goes out and gets collected here uh, into the oviduct, right? So uh, you've probably heard the term fallopian tubes. Oviduct is another term for the fallopian tubes. So if duct is, uh, you know, something that leads somewhere and ovi, ova is referring to the egg, okay? So the oviduct is the, the, like the hallway basically that leads into the uterus. So this oviduct is where fertilization occurs. So after the female has been mated, those little sperms are gonna swim up into the oviduct and meet up with the egg there. So oviduct is the site of fertilization. That's where that egg gets fertilized. So fertilization refers to that uh, sperm and the egg meeting up. So they meet up, that sperm uh, kind of breaks through the outer shell of the, uh, of the ova, and then, um, and then fertilization happens, and we see, uh, you know, the beginning of a little puppy or a little kitten. So once fertilization occurs, we call that the embryo now. So that embryo is going to travel uh, down through the oviduct and into the uterus. Um, so the uterus here is divided kind of into two parts. So there's the uterine horn. And we can see here that there's two horns. And then we have the uterine body. Those two together make up the uterus. So in hu human females, we tend to have just a uh, single uterus. Um, so it's just basically, you know, just a little kind of circle sac. But uh, in dogs and cats, they have a Y-shaped uterus. So that Y-shaped uterus basically just gives them more room for implantation to be able to have uh, multiple births from every, um, from every pregnancy. Um, so once that, uh, once that embryo has traveled into the uterus, it's going to pick a place and it's going to implant. So it implants into the endometrium. The endometrium, uh, I'll write this under here, endometrium. The endometrium is the inner lining of the uterus and it's nice and cozy and cushy for that little embryo to settle in. So that embryo after implantation continues to grow. Uh, it develops what's called a placenta. 
So placentas, honestly, I think are amazing. So a placenta is an entirely new organ. There's one for every uh, baby in the uterus. Um, and basically the body makes a new organ for every puppy or every kitten, or in the case of humans, every little human in there. And that, um, that placenta acts as like the connection between the mother and the pup or the kitten. So the puppy or kitten are connected to the placenta via their umbilical cord. And then the placenta uh, basically attaches into the uterus. So it acts as um, like the connection between the two. So it can filter out waste, bring in nutrients, etc. So the placenta is really quite amazing. Uh, so once that little embryo is grown and grown and grown, it becomes a fetus. And then that fetus gets big enough that it's time now for birth to happen. So the um, medical term for birth is parturition. So when parturition occurs, that little uh, now fetus is going to travel through the uterus. And right here, this is the cervix. So the cervix is at the base of the uterus and it's usually closed up tight. It prevents infection from getting in and it prevents little puppies or kittens from falling out. So we've got that cervix usually closed, but at the time of parturition, that cervix is going to dilate, which means, um, so if something's dilating, it's getting bigger, right? So think of um, like your pupils dilating if it's dark outside, right? So it, it's getting bigger. And then those puppies can pass through the cervix and then through the vagina. So um, the vagina is the birth canal. Uh, and then the outer, so the vulva is just everything external. So the vagina is just the tube and it's internal. The vulva is all the external portion of the body. Um, so uh, the little fetus is going to pass through that birth canal out of the vulva and it will be born. Then um, typically the mother is going to like eat the placenta, eat the... Um, eat the sac that's around the animal and choose off the uh, umbilical cord. So when we're talking now time from uh, fertilization to birth, uh, that's called the gestation period. So the gestation period for dogs and cats is an average of about two months, so 63 days. So it takes about that two months for the, uh, for the little pups or kittens to be ready to be born. <clears throat> so um, female dogs are called bitches. And I know that sounds maybe kind of not the nicest, but it is not a swear word when we're talking about female dogs. So uh, uh, bitches have a little bit of a different cycle than humans. They have an estrus cycle. Well, I think ours is called estrus cycle as well, but theirs is a different type of cycle. So the estrus cycle has an O in it, okay? So think like a cycle typically is a circle, right? Because it goes around and around and around. The estrus cycle has an O in it to represent that circle, okay? And I mention this because one of the stages of the estrus cycle with an O is estrus with no O. <laughs> so estrus is like the true heat. So estrus is a portion of estrus. Um, so when the animal is in a true heat, so we're talking dogs right now, they're receptive to the male's sexual advances. So a dog isn't always in heat uh, and they will usually um, like deny the male. So they might like rah, 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 and turn around and snap at them if the male tries to mount them when they're not in estrus. But when they're in estrus, this true heat they're all about it. They want those, uh, they want those male dogs to couple up with them. So dogs, when they have this estrus cycle uh, is when they're ovulating and they ovulate regardless of being mated or not. So when a, a dog is in heat, they'll be in heat for the amount of time they would be in heat. If they get mated then and it results in a pregnancy, great if that's the goal or sorry if it's not the goal. Um, and if they do not get mated and do not achieve a pregnancy, then that estrus just goes away and they continue along their cycle. So dogs tend to uh, come into estrus twice per year. So two times per year. 
So they have the potential then to have two litters of puppies per year. Um, dogs are a little bit different than uh, humans in the way their estrus cycle works. So typically for humans, if you are passing blood, uh, so you're menstruating, you're not usually fertile during that time. But with dogs, when they're passing blood during this estrus, during their heat, that's actually when they're at their most fertile. So they're a little bit different than the way humans work. And sometimes um, that can be alarming for, for um, owners. Sometimes they'll call and say like, I think my dog has her period. It's not really a period. It's a, it's a different kind of thing altogether. So that covers bitches or female dogs. So female cats are called queens. And yeah, I'm sure you're wondering like, really dogs are bitches, which is like a negative term. And female cats are queens, which I think is fairly a positive word. So it's a little bit funny there how we refer to those two. Uh, but female queens, so female cats, these guys are induced ovulators. So this is, I think, very interesting. If an animal is an induced ovulator, it means that they're only going to ovulate, the ovary's only going to release that egg if, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, if the cat has been mated. So in dogs, they're going to release that egg regardless, and they might not be mated during that time. But for a cat, when they come into heat, they save all those little mature eggs and wait to release them until they've been mated. It's like an evolutionary adaptation that allows the uh, cat to ensure that those eggs aren't gonna go to waste. So if the body goes to all the effort to make the egg and release the egg, that cat wants to make damn sure that there's sperm's there to meet it. So they will not release the egg until they've been mated. So what's interesting about that is that the cat can be mated once and then release eggs from the ovary and those eggs could be fertilized by that one mate and then that female cat will still be feeling fairly frisky and will continue along her way and maybe meet up with a, another handsome tom cat and uh, she might think well what the heck why not have another partner and then uh, she might be mated by that partner and then her ovary could release more eggs and those eggs could be fertilized by the sperm from the second partner. So it is possible for kittens in a litter to be, um, have different fathers or different sires. So I think that's an interesting thing about cats. So they'll continue to show signs of heat. They'll just cycle through their heat cycle over and over and over until they've been mated. So if you have an indoor female cat that is unspayed, she's gonna be bloody obnoxious. She's um, gonna come into heat and wow, wow, be like making all these yowly sounds trying to attract mates. And you are gonna be very irritated with her. So I strongly recommend uh, spaying your female cats because they're gonna be super obnoxious. I also say spay your female dogs. If you're not planning on mating your animals, there's no reason to keep them intact. Uh, animals that have been spayed reduce their chances of um, developing mammary tumors, so uh, like breast tissue tumors, by 80%. That's amazing. That's a really great statistic. So they really should be spayed or neutered. And we just like, we don't need more puppies and kittens just randomly happening. So it's a really good idea to make sure that your animals are spayed. Um... Was there anything else I wanted to add about female dogs and cats? No, I think that's it. Um, so we'll move on then to the male reproductive system. Actually, maybe I'll go over the terms right now because they're all pretty related to the female more so than the male. So we'll talk about the terms first. So uh, the reproductive system terms that we have to discuss here, the first one is pyometra. So uh, metri, we remember, is one of the root words for uterus, and pi means pus. So a pyometra is a collection of pus in the uterus. So when that happens, um, we can have two types of pyometras. So an open pyometra, the cervix is open a little bit. So even though this area is all filled up with pus, it can leak out of the cervix, through the vagina, and out the vulva. So uh, often the owners will complain of like a really smelly discharge from the vulva. 
If, however, we have a closed cervix, we can now have a closed pyometra, which means this area is filled with pus and it's going to continue to fill with more and more and more and more pus until um, basically if it's left untreated, that uterus could rupture. So uh, a pyometra is an emergency situation. We want that animal to be in and to see the vet right away. And we would like to schedule a uh, surgery to repair that right away. And the surgery we're going to do to treat a pyometra is a spay surgery. We're just gonna remove that uterus and ovaries altogether. <clears throat> so lactation, lactation is closely related to the reproductive system because once you produce those little babies, you need to feed them somehow. So mothers are going to make and secrete milk and that's called lactation. Um, one term I don't think is on here is colostrum. Colostrum is the first, oh, whoops, first. It's really nutrient dense. I shouldn't be writing on this paper. Uh, and it's full of antibodies. So that the mother can pass on immunity to her little babies. Uh, and they have such small stomachs when they're born, so we want really nutrient-dense milk. Oh, milk. I forgot to add that word. So colostrum is the first milk. It's nutrient-dense and full of antibodies. Uh, and uh, that lasts for like the first, uh, I think, day, maybe day or two. And then uh, it moves on to just regular milk after that. So uterus, we see here that there's the four combining terms. We have hyster, metra, metri, and uter. So if you just know that those four mean uterus, I'm quite happy with that. Um, the sometimes people ask me, well, what's the difference? Like, why are there four terms? Why can't they make it easy? So technically, each the terms are referring to different parts of the uterus or the uterus in whole. So uh, I'm fine, though, if you just know that those four are uterus. So ova, ova is the plural form of ovum, and ovum means egg. This is the female sex cell. The male sex cell is sperm. So the endometrium, it's the inner lining of the uterus. That's where, um, where implantation takes place. That's where the, the little embryos settle in. So we can use our word parts to figure out what this is if we didn't know. So EM is a tissue, endo is within or interior, right? And metri is the uterus. So it's the tissue inside the uterus, endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus. Gravid is a term that means pregnant. It can also be a root word, just gravid. A neonate is a newborn. In uh, puppies and kittens, that's any, uh, any little baby less than four weeks old. Over four weeks, we don't consider them a neonate or a newborn anymore. Parturition is the act of giving birth to a fetus. Um, the placenta, this whole thing is all about the placenta. Uh, we talked about that. It's sometimes called the afterbirth because usually it comes out right after the puppy or the kitten. Um, so it's, a, it's, it is an organ and then there's a tissue sac enclosing the fetus and connecting that fetus to the mother. Uh, so the connecting the, the placenta connects the fetus to the mother. Uh, it passes nutrients and oxygen through to the fetus and pulls waste away from the fetus uh, through the placenta and into the mother, and then the mother expels that waste. So the fetus is attached to the placenta via an umbilical cord. The placenta is a really interesting organ. So pseudocyesis. This means a false pregnancy. Uh, so this is fairly uh, common in dogs, especially if they've been artificially inseminated. So sometimes, um, Sometimes breeders will want to have a specific sire for their puppies, but they maybe are like across the country from them. So the uh, owner of the male might sell sperm and then artificially inseminate the female. Sometimes though, that'll just trigger this whole hormone reaction thing that ends up with the animal having a false pregnancy. 
So a false pregnancy means that the animal's acting like they're pregnant. They have a lot of hormonal things going on like they're pregnant. They might even start making milk like they're pregnant, but they're not pregnant. They don't have any puppies in there. A hysterectomy is removal of just the uterus. I don't really know anyone that's doing that. They tend to do an ovario hysterectomy and remove the ovaries as well. So gestation, that's the time of development of the fetus from conception to birth. So in, uh, when we're talking conception, we're talking about um, uh, fertilization there to birth. Uh, so in dogs and cats, it's about 63 days, so two months. Dystocia, that's a difficulty giving birth to a fetus. So there's a few reasons that might happen. Maybe the fetus is too big. Maybe a fetus is in a strange position. Or sometimes the, the mother's uterine muscles are really weak, so they're not uh, really able to push out that fetus the way they should. So dystocia is an emergency as well. We should see animals suffering from dystocia in the hospital to, uh, to help things along there. The oviduct, that's where fertilization takes place. Um, it's AKA fallopian tubes. And then, right, we talked about estrus with the O being the reproductive cycle in general. And then estrus with just the U, no O, that's, the, that's a part of estrus cycle. And that's the true heat. So in dogs, that's when the dog, the female dog is sexually receptive to the male. Estrus usually occurs about twice per year, so every six months. Uh, an animal that is intact has not been sexually altered, so they still have their ovaries and uterus, or in the male, they still have their testicles. And then castration or neuter are both terms for um, for altering, sexually altering a male dog, so we're removing the testicles. And then ovario hysterectomy or spay is the term for removing the ovaries and the uterus in the female. Okay, so moving on then to the male reproductive system. So uh, figure 4-28 on page 99 in your Elsevier gives a way more detailed picture of the male reproductive system, but I'm kind of simplifying it here for you for just the terms you kind of need to know for our test purposes. So male reproductive system consists of a few things here. So number one, we've got the testicle. The testicle is responsible for making sperm. Uh, there's another little part on, of the, on the testicle called the epididymis. You don't need to know that term for um, like the test, but I'm pretty sure in the review there's a question about the epididymis. I can't remember if I took it out, but if I didn't take it out, the epididymis is where sperm is stored and uh, matures. So the testicle is housed inside the scrotum. So the scrotum is a really interesting part of the anatomy. So the testicle makes sperm, but it only does that at the absolute perfect temperature. And do you think it would be nice and convenient if that perfect temperature was body temperature since the testicle is part of the body? I think that would be convenient. Nope. Testicle decides he wants to do things a little bit differently. Uh, he likes to have his temperature just a couple degrees lower than body temperature. That makes it tricky to keep the proper temperature for sperm production. So that's where the scrotum comes in. So the scrotum is going to house the testicle and as well, it's going to maintain the correct temperature for the testicle by relaxing the testicle away from the body when the body is warm. And if the outside area is cold, it's going to retract and pull that testicle closer to the body to keep it warmer. So uh, the scrotum then responsible for housing the testicle and um, maintaining the correct temperature for the testicle. So I, I, think, I think that's very interesting. So uh, we have little sperms being produced in the testicle and now uh, it is time for ejaculation. So those little sperms are gonna travel up this tube here, which is, oh, which is a vas deferens. If you've ever heard of a vasectomy before, what a vasectomy does is it cuts out a little piece of this tube 
and staples it off on either side so that the sperm can't get out of the testicle but everything else still operates as normal so the body still makes um, like the semen fluid there's just no sperm in it uh, in dogs a, va a vasectomy is pretty rare I've heard of vasectomies being done in some dogs like maybe show dogs where they want them to keep their testicles but they don't want them to breed anymore uh, but it's fairly rare to do a vasectomy in a dog usually we want to stop their sexual behaviors so we want to remove those testicles because they are such a driving force in terms of hormone production in the body so we see uh, with with neutering animals or male dogs and male cats we tend to see less aggressive behaviors with them so that's one of the benefits of neutering besides just population control and also we see less problems with this guy which is the prostate so the prostate makes fluid that keeps the sperm nice and comfortable while it's traveling into and through the female reproductive system. Uh, there are a few other glands as well that contribute fluids to the uh, semen, but um, we only need to know the prostate for our purposes here. So after it's passed through vas deferin, passed past the prostate, we enter this guy and this is the urethra. That sounds familiar. Isn't that part of the urinary system? Yes, yes it is. So the urethra is part of the urinary system and the male reproductive system, but you notice in the female reproductive system, no urethra to be found. So the urethra is in, in the male reproductive system and the urinary system for the male as well. So the urethra exits through this, which is the penis. Uh, and then covering the penis is the prepuce. So when an, a male dog or a male cat uh, becomes aroused, this penis area engorges with blood and the prepuce retracts and the penis sticks out of it. Uh, maybe you've seen, um, oops, maybe you've seen a dog that is aroused and people will often call it the lipstick because it looks kind of like lipstick sticking out of a lipstick tube. Um, also just an interesting fact, I, I think it's kind of interesting. So, you know, like, I don't know, I think human men can be gross, but they'll just like slangly refer to an erection as a boner. Uh, but like, there's no bone in the penis in the human male, but there is in dogs, they have a bone in the penis and it's called the os penis. So I, I think that's a fun and interesting fact. So hopefully you think it's fun too. Um... And honestly, I think that's about it for the male reproductive system. Um, oh, there's one other thing I want to mention actually. So you can see this in your McBride textbook. Uh, on page 363, I think it is. It, I can't read my writing there, but it's figure 17-2. Uh, and it's called the tie. So male dogs have a little kind of swelling um, just above the penis and it's called the bulbous glandus. So the bulbous glandus swells up when the dog is aroused. This is an important thing for you to know because I have had owners call into the clinic saying, I think my dog has like a lump on his belly. I say, oh, okay, do you want to describe it to me? And they say, well, here's the thing though. It kind of comes and goes. Like sometimes he's laying there and I can see it and other times it's it's not there. And I say, okay, so what area of the belly is it in? And they say, well, it's on either side of, uh, you know, his penis. So often owners are uncomfortable using correct terminology for the reproductive area. So they might be a little bit shy about communicating this. But those two little bumps on either side of the penis, those are the bulbous glandus, and they get swollen during arousal just the same way as the penis does. So the purpose of the bulbous glandus is that when the male dog mates with the female dog, this bulbous glandus locks them together. So after they're done mating, it's called the tie because it's like they're tied together and they'll be stuck together for a good like 20, 30 minutes. So often, so do dogs will, um, you know, the male like mounts the female from behind. And then when he's done, often he'll like kind of flip over and it's like they'll be stuck butt to butt. 
and that's the tie. That's what that figure is showing you. So have a look at that because I, I think it's quite, it's quite funny, I think. But the purpose of that, that's another evolutionary adaptation. It ensures for the male that uh, it's his sperm that would impregnate that female to carry on his genetic material, right? Uh, because they're locked together, uh, he knows that no other fem or no other males have come after that female as well. Uh, so it is an interesting adaptation to ensure that specific genetic material gets uh, passed on. So I think that's an interesting uh, an interesting fact as well about male reproductive system in dogs. Um, so I did just mention while I was talking about that that sometimes clients are kind of shy about using the correct terminology when they're talking about the reproductive system. And you know what? It's not just clients too. Sometimes it's us, right, that work in the field. So I think it is really important in a medical facility to use those correct medical terms. So if you're not comfortable seeing words like scrotum or testicle or penis, I suggest practicing it in the privacy of your home until you get nice and comfortable with those words. It can be a little bit tricky, yeah, to talk about vulvas or uh, vaginal health with, uh, you know, this elderly gentleman client. Uh, so we want to work on being comfortable using those terms. If you are at all uncomfortable with them, and many people aren't, it's nothing to be ashamed of. We live in a culture that A, way over sexualizes everybody, B, while at the same time shaming everybody about sex. So it's totally normal to feel embarrassed having to talk about those things. So if that is you, I would say just practice on it and work on it. Um, look at it entirely from a medical perspective and hopefully that'll help you to kind of relax about using those words. Uh, I really do encourage you to use the correct terminology. Uh, I just have a little side story for you here. I used to work with a technologist who would always say balls instead of testicles and it just grossed me out so much. So she'd be like shaving a dog for a neuter and she'd be like, oh my goodness, oh, these balls are so hairy. Oh, they keep slipping. I'm like, stop saying balls. Like it just grossed me out. So use the correct term. It's a testicle, say testicle. Okay, so that's about it for the reproductive systems. So we've talked about the male and the female. You can read about them in the Elsevier textbook pages 98 to 103. I'm pretty sure McBride covers the reproductive systems with the urinary system in chapter 12. Uh, so you can read about it in there. And I guess, I don't know, I'm assuming chapter 17 just because of this figure 17-2, uh, the tie. Uh, I also do have a review sheet for you as a practice activity. So that will be in the bright space. You can check that out. If you do have any questions at all about the reproductive system, please make sure you do ask during the virtual classroom in the chat or send me an email. It's very important to understand everything you're, you're learning. If you do have questions or you feel like I didn't explain anything thoroughly enough, I'm really honestly so happy to elaborate and explain it again for you. So thanks so much for listening to my hopefully fun lecture about the reproductive systems. Thank you.